the monks at a remote monastery deep in the woods had a rigid vow of silence. And that vow was that only one monk was allowed to speak once a year on Christmas, one sentence. And that was all the speaking that was allowed in the monastery. So three Christmases ago, Brother Michael had his one sentence, it was his turn, and he said, I just love the mashed potatoes that they serve with our Christmas roast. Then 365 days of silence follows. And then Brother Thomas, it was his turn, and he said, I hate the mashed potatoes. They are cold and lumpy. And then 365 days of silence. And then Brother Paul, it was his turn, and he says, we have to stop this constant bickering. <laughs> Sometimes I think days of silence wouldn't be bad for us, right? I, I know in culture we certainly could use it, at least turn off the things where all the comments are made, but, but speaking sometimes gets us in trouble. In the beginning of chapter 4, James asks his readers a question. And he says, what causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? And the passage we're looking at this morning, James is going to continue to answer that question. It's very clear through all of Scripture that God wants his people unified. He hates grumbling. He hates division. Unity is incredibly important to Jesus. In fact, as he was facing his last hours before the cross, he lifted up a prayer, a prayer to the Heavenly Father, and in it he interceded on our behalf. As he cried out to the Father, one of the things he most fervently prayed for was unity. John 17, 20 to 23, Jesus' words crying out to the Father were this, I do not ask for these only, meaning the disciples that were on hand at the time, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that's us, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them, and they may be one, even as we are one, I and them, and you and me, that they may become perfectly one, so that the world may know that you have sent me and loved them even as you loved me. So James, knowing the importance of unity to the mission of reaching people for Jesus Christ, asked that opening question. What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? James then went on. As, as ch chapter 4 progressed to the point of what we're going to look at today, and he, he talked about friendship with the world, and he talked about submitting ourselves to God and resisting the devil and the importance of having humility. He went on to say how, how God opposes the proud and resists them. He talked about washing our hands of sin and drawing near to God, allowing him to purify our hearts. Last week, we heard an amazing message from Pastor Susan and Elise Walgren, who equipped us to want what God wants, love what God loves, and live how he wants us to live. And now moving forward in chapter 4, James is about to touch on a couple of the most important do-nots of Scripture. They're so important in terms of keeping unity, relationships sound and whole and healthy. And that is, do not... Speak evil against your brother, and do not judge your brother. James 4, 11 and 12 says this, Do not speak evil against one brother, brothers. The one who speaks against a brother or judges his brother speaks evil against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is only one lawgiver and judge, he who is able to save and destroy, but who are you to judge your neighbor? So as we break that down, let's look first at the beginning of James 4.11. James 4.11 says this, Do not speak evil against one another, brothers. Do not speak evil against one another. In other versions of the Bible, the word they use for speaking evil is slander. And the Bible has a lot to say about slander. Proverbs 10, 18 
It says, he who conceals hatred has lying lips, and he who spreads slander is a fool. Matthew 12, 36, but I tell you that every careless word that people speak, they shall give an accounting for it in the day of judgment. Psalm 101, 5 says, whoever secretly slanders his neighbor, him I will destroy. No one who has a haughty look and an arrogant heart will I endure. Now I'm going to raise the stakes just a little bit, just a little bit as we discuss these words. Because as we look at the beginning of James 4.11 again, James 4.11, do not speak evil against one another, brothers. The Greek word for the, the phrase speak evil is katala leo, katala leo. And that has actually a broader meaning than slander. See, slander is speaking untruths about someone, right? It's about, it's about tearing them down with lies. Katalaleo is speaking down about someone, whether true or not. So James is talking about speaking down against someone, even if what you have to say is true. Remember a few weeks ago when I preached on the tongue, I gave you sort of a proverbial guard for your lips, and I gave you three questions to ask before you say something. Just wisdom would call us to exercise wisdom when we speak, right? And we talked about three things we could use as a guard, to, to ask, three questions we could ask ourselves before we decide to come out with what we want to say. Do you remember the first one? Is it true? Is what I'm about to say, what I want to say, what I'm tempted to say, what I'm provoked to say, is it true? Is it really true? Is it an exaggeration? Is it partly true? Is it kind of true? Or is it true? If it's not true, don't say it. That's a guard on your lips. And if it's true, what's the next question? Is it kind? Is it something that's kind? Is it, will it build someone up or will it tear them down? Now, if it's true and if it's kind, I think I'm on safe ground to say it's probably okay to do it. God wants us encouraging others, right? It's true, it's kind, go for it. But if it's true and it could feel kind or it might not feel kind, it might be a little harder thing you have to say, there's a third question we want to ask. Is it true? Is it kind? Is it uh, you guys are the best. You're the best. <laughs> Is it necessary? Is it necessary? Is it, something might be true, and something might, it might not be kind, but you have to decide, is this really necessary for me to say? Because maybe somebody needs to tell that person, but maybe you're not the one. Maybe the person's kind of out of line, but you're talking to somebody else. It's not necessary. Is it true? Is it kind? Is it necessary? Kataleo could be a violation of any one of these three things. We need to have a guard on our lips and measure more what we say. Kent Hughes, Bible commentator Kent Hughes, puts it this way. The command here forbids any speech, whether true or false, which runs down another person. Most people think it's okay to convey negative information if it's true. We understand that lying is immoral, but passing along damaging truth immoral? It seems almost a moral responsibility. People need to know how awful that person is. <laughs> By such reasoning, criticism behind another's back is thought to be all right as long as it's true. Likewise, denigrating gossip, of course, it's never called gossip. Often in the Christian realm, it's, you should pray for this person because, you know, you know they're really struggling with this. <laughs> that, that makes us sound holy and still runs the other person down all at the same time. It's perfect. It's, it's, it, then it says it's okay if the information's true. That's what we think. Thus, many believers use truth as a license to righteously diminish others' reputations. And you know what? James is calling us out on it. Enough. Enough. So after admonishing not to speak evil in any way against one another, James finishes verse 11, James 4.11. The end of it says this. The one who speaks against a brother or judges his brother speaks evil against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. See, James is saying if you judge someone else, you are inappropriately putting yourself above in authority over that person. You're making yourself a judge, and you don't get to do that. 
And he goes one step further. He says, if you judge someone or speak evil against someone, you're actually doing something even worse. You are becoming a judge of the law. You are judging the law itself because you're choosing to willingly violate it. And who does that really mean? If you are putting yourself above a law that is upheld by, and instituted by God himself, who are you really putting yourself above? Putting yourself above God. You know, here is a principle of following Christ that's really important for us to grasp, so important. And, when, and, and, and that is, is, is it, it's just, I, if you can grab a hold of one thing out of this message, this would be a good one to grab a hold of. However you are treating someone, kind and gentle or rough and coarse, grace-giving and, and building up, or unforgiving and judgmental, encouraging or tearing down. However you're treating someone at any given moment, you are treating Jesus the same way. Whenever you're treating someone, however you're treating them in some moment, you are treating Jesus the same way. And because so much of our lives is lived horizontally, we forget that, or we never knew it. And when we treat people how we treat them, based on our emotions, based on our anger, based on our frustration, based on our judgment of them, and we forget that Jesus is the one who draws a parallel between how we treat other people and how we're treating him, we lose sight of the vertical. Well, I want to bring in the, the clearest possible way the vertical to us front and center right now. Matthew 25, verses 31 to 46 says this, When the Son of Man comes in glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. Before him will be gathered all the nations, and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep on his right, but the goats are on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you a drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you or naked and clothe you? And when did we uh, see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the, the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they will also answer, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you? Then he will answer them, saying, Truly I say to you, what you did not do to the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Now make no mistake about what Jesus is saying here. He is saying there will be two groups of people at the final judgment. He's not saying they're divided by what each group did. Don't get that wrong. We have to look at this in the context of all of Scripture. That's not what he's saying. He, remember, he addressed the sheep, the people to his right, and said, come to you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. He's talking to Christ followers. He's talking there to people he has called, the people who, who follow Christ and have put their faith in Jesus. And that's a, a crazy thought because sometimes we think, I think we forget that we were called when we put our faith in Jesus. And we think, well, I accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. I'm so glad I did that. Do you realize when you did that, it's because God himself drew you to himself? You didn't have some incredible spiritual insight one day and say, you know what, darn it, I am gonna, I'm going to accept Jesus on my own. I'm dead in my sin. I can't do anything about it, but I've got this spiritual insight. No, God, in his goodness, loves you. 
And he gave you that, that pull, that draw, that calling to put your faith in Jesus. He does so much for us that we can't even see, but he does it. It, it, It's called being, in this passage, it's called being blessed by my Father. Those of you who are blessed by the Father, who are called into the kingdom, and then uh, the things that, that we're talking about doing here are the things that we're called to do, the things in living out or working out our salvation. Yes, we are called to love those who are lesser than. We are called to feed the hungry and give drink to the thirsty. And, and visit the sick and those in prison and, and not give up on anyone. That is the kingdom of God. That's the, what the army of Christ, that's what we are, are to do. And so he's talking about these things and he's talking about the least of these. But, but back to my main point in using this passage to bring greater understanding to this morning's text, Jesus said, whatever you did for the least of these, you did for me. You see, what we do or don't do for others, what we say or don't say, whether we build up or whether we tear down, however you're treating someone in any particular moment, you are treating Jesus in the same way. So important to remember. James 4.11 again, the one who speaks against a brother or judges his brother speaks evil against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. God is clear. Don't speak evil of others and don't judge others. Therefore, when you do, you are deciding what I want to do is more important than what God wants me to do. So as your pastor, I have to ask you, in those moments when you willingly disobey what the word of God tells you to do, who is your Lord? Because in that moment, it doesn't appear to be Jesus, does it? Not in that moment. And when you declare yourself above the law by ignoring it, James says you fall into a category that he has been preaching against this entire book. James said if you're not, if you are judging others, you are not a doer of the word. You're not a doer of the word. If you ignore if you're ignoring the law, if you're judging others, you're a judge of the word. And of course, judging others. Is, is what's behind much of our da- down-talking of others, our trashing others, our gossiping, or our, our putting them down in the name of a prayer request or any of those kind of things. You know, judging others is an internal process. See, judging others is a conspiring of our mind and our heart to, to harden against, to condemn another person. And so, so how does that come out in us when we've made that decision, when our heart and mind have conspired against someone to judge them? How does that often come out? It often comes out in speaking evil about them, speaking behind their back, speaking evil uh, trash about them. Sometimes it might come out speaking evil directly to them. That seems a little better, but I'm not sure. <laughs> it might be a little better, but we can do a lot of damage face to face. I don't know if you've noticed. Something we could be a... View, Uh, verbally abusive. We can be harsh. We can tear somebody down. Evil is evil. James is saying, don't judge. And the reality is, when are we prone to judge? When are we prone to to judge somebody else? When we're hurt? When we're angry? When we're offended? When we're arrogant? I can't believe they would do that. I can't believe they think that way. I can't believe they believe that way. In other words, judging comes out of brokenness. And James is telling us to knock it off. Here's an, another nugget. Another nugget. If you take this and you apply it to your life and you put a high standard into your life that you're going you're gonna to keep this in mind and live by it, it will transform your relationships. It, it is that, it's that powerful. It's simple. It's simple. It might seem obvious. But if you'll really put it into your life, it will transform your relationships. Are you ready? Ready for relationships to be transformed? Yeah. All right, let's do it. Here it is. The emotions or brokenness, anger, frustration, the emotions or brokenness you're experiencing are never an excuse to mistreat other people. They're never an excuse. I was angry. I was mad. He ticked me off. Of course I did this. No, not an excuse. I was frustrated. You couldn't believe what they did to me. Not an excuse. 
we're told not to sin in our anger. What do we want to do when we're hurt? What do we want to do when we're angry? What do we want to do when we're offended? We want to lash out, right? I am at my creative, witty best when I am ticked off. I am. I can zing you. I'm, I'm good at it. I don't know why. It's a gift. <laughs> but, but it's because I'm judging somebody in that moment out of my emotion, and I have no right to do that. I have no right to judge somebody else harshly. But when I'm angry, I want to, and I even do. Before I do damage, I need to check myself. I, do, I need to tell myself, just because of this emotion, this anger, I don't have a right to mistreat the person in front of me or the person I'm, I'm thinking about. Ask God to help you with this. I have, I am, because we're going to need it. But then place this high standard in your life and don't let your flesh get away with it. We need to be in charge of our flesh. Through the Holy Spirit, we can decide. We get to decide. Don't let your flesh have it its way. Have your way with your flesh. Put the standard into your life and hold yourself to a higher standard. We can do it. We can do it. And when we fail, go to God. Ask for forgiveness. Maybe the person, if that's appropriate, ask for forgiveness and ask for God's help again. Judging causes fights and quarrels. It's an affront to God because he loves and values unity. And, and in us putting ourselves above the law, here's the reality. I am not holy enough to judge another human being. And here's another one. Neither are you. We are not holy enough to judge another human being. Now, before moving on, I do want to issue one clarification um, because sometimes we have to say hard things to people, right? Sometimes we do have to confront a sin or something out in someone's life. And James gets to that point in the very last book, verse of this whole book. He says in James 5, 19 to 20, My brothers, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. And of course, with an unbeliever, that's the truth. If you haven't put your faith in Jesus and you can lead somebody to Christ, you are, you are keeping them. You're turning them from a goat into a sheep, right? You're, God has already done it, of course, but I'm just saying that when, when you are willing to get somebody, help somebody repent from their sin, that's not necessarily unkind and that's not judging of you. If there's sin in someone's life and your objective is to restore them, then of course it's okay to check on them and talk to them about it. Helping someone out of their sin is an act of love if it's done with grace and correct motive. Grace and correct motive. We can do that because we're helping the person. If your motive is that, if your motive is to lash them because you've judged them, no. There is a difference. There's a right way to do things and a wrong way to do things. All right, let's wrap this up. James 4.12. There's only one lawgiver and judge. He who is able to save and to destroy, but who are you to judge your neighbor? In this verse, I love it because you know what James is doing? He's putting us right next to God. He's putting us right next to God. He's saying there's only one lawgiver and judge. We know who that is, right? It's Jesus. There's only one. And yet another reminder, this is another reminder of what we say so often around here. God is God, and I am not. Let's say it. God is God, and I am not. And praise God for that, right? Because it's only Jesus that has the power to save and destroy. Amen? It's only Jesus that has the power to wash away sin. Amen? I praise God that no one, no one has to depend on their salvation for me to be or do anything. That is way too heavy lifting for me. I can't do it. Each of us have to turn to Jesus. And for that same reason, for that same reason, I have no business judging anyone. Now, that doesn't mean that we're not to evaluate actions and behaviors that clearly um, go against the word of God, right? And, and we, we, sometimes we have to discern whether a behavior is sinful or not. In fact, as we walk in this world, it's important that we do that. However, we can't take that next step and cast judgment on the person. Pray for them, yes. 
love them, yes. Confront them and, and try to help them out of their sin, maybe if you have that place in, your, in their life and, and God prompts you to, yes. But judge and condemn them, no. James said there is only one lawgiver and one judge. His name is Jesus Christ. Only Jesus is able to save and destroy in a spiritual sense. Therefore, only Jesus has the right to judge. We are mere peers, flawed and dependent on God's grace ourselves. The bottom line, we aren't holy enough to judge. So as we close, let's turn away from our habit of judging others. Let's ask God to soften our hearts. Let's ask him to help us to live in a new way, a way of unity, a way of peace, a way of humility, a way of love. Let's turn away and turn upwards to Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love you, we praise you, and we thank you. And Lord, I just ask on behalf of each person who would willingly agree with me here that you would forgive us for our propensity to judge. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would come in and soften our hearts, that we would have genuine love for other people. And I pray, God, that while we would never lose our discernment of being able to measure what's going on against the Word of God, that we would never turn that into judgment because we aren't holy enough to judge. I pray, Lord, that you would fill our hearts with compassion and love and humility and truth so that we may preserve the unity of the church and that so many, many more people may come to know Jesus as their Savior. We love you, we praise you, and we thank you. We pray it all in the amazing name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.